Hello Old House Evangelical. It's great to be able to join with you today. I'm sorry that it couldn't be in person. Unfortunately, that just wasn't possible this morning. But it is great to at least be with you and join with you and share a little bit about uh, our work and to share the scriptures with you. I'm speaking to you from here in Renfrew, which is where I live, uh, and a local woods, and I'll explain a bit about why later on. First, let me tell you a little bit about Tear Fund. Tear Fund believe that poverty is not part of God's plan. We work primarily with the local church all around the world in order to unlock people's potential, in order to address poverty. We want to both mitigate for poverty and, and the consequences and what's actually happening in, in the lives of those who are poorest around the world, but we also want to prevent it as well. What I'll do is later on in the service, I'll share a little bit about the work that we are doing with, uh, around the world in 50 countries all around the world. But before I do so, let's actually look at today's passage and study it a bit. Today we're going to look at Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, following the series that you've already been doing on the kingdom of God and Jesus' sayings around the kingdom of God. So let's just read today's passage, Matthew chapter 13. He told them another parable. The kingdom of God, and the kingdom of heaven, sorry, is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 30 kilograms of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. A number of years ago, in 2014, I remember being at Ibrox Stadium. I'm not a big football supporter. I don't often go to football matches or, uh, and watch them. Uh, for me, I prefer a game of rugby. But I was sitting in Ibrox Stadium in, in 2014 and I was watching rugby. And you might remember that the Commonwealth Games were here in Glasgow in 2014 and the Rugby Sevens were being played at Ibrox. I just remember being there and being a part of the crowds. And you had an unusual games being played. You had people like New Zealand playing Barbados or South Africa playing Trinidad and Tobago. Some of the biggest teams around the world, like New Zealand, playing teams that you never would associate with rugby, like Barbados. And as you sat in the crowds, you just got a wee flavour of Scottish culture. You can imagine the scene. New Zealand grab the ball and they run towards the other end. Are the Scottish crowds cheering? Not really. Barbados managed to tackle and grab the ball. The crowds come into uproar. They cheer, they celebrate, they roar. Barbados have the ball and are going for the touchline. It's not because there were lots of Barbados people living uh, or watching the game in Ibrox. That wasn't true. It was most, mostly Scottish people, people from around Glasgow watching it. But there was something about the underdog grabbing the ball that rallied the Scottish supporters together. They cheered and they roared. It's not that they had particular allegiances towards Barbados. It's because they were keen to support the underdog, the unlikely winner, the one who was going to make it to the end. As we look throughout the Bible, we hear all sorts of stories about the underdog who is defeating and the, the, the champions, the victors, and then they're becoming the greatest, even though they're the smallest. We think of stories such as David and Goliath. David with just a couple of stones in a, in a sling. And yet, David, this young boy, the youngest of his family, con conquering this giant of a man, Goliath, that everybody else was feared, fear, afraid to even challenge. Or we think of Joseph, that brother who was thrown into a pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, 
who was thought of as nothing by his brothers. And yet, he's a very person who ended up administrating over Egypt, who managed to store up everything else for a famine. And those brothers actually went to him to get food in the midst of that time. Or we think of somebody else like Moses. Moses, who ran away from Egypt because he'd killed a guard. He ran away, ashamed, dismal. God spoke to him from that burning bush. Give him a vision. And yet this man, who felt of himself as nothing, was leading the people of, out of Egypt towards the promised land. Or we think of Mary. As we approach Christmas, we're thinking a little bit more about the Christmas story. But Mary thought of herself as being a humble servant. That was the words that she used in her prayer, a humble servant. Somebody who thought of themselves as nothing, but God used for the birth of Jesus Christ. Or we think of Jesus himself. To the, those round about, they would have considered him as a carpenter's boy. Somebody from Nazareth, and nothing ever comes good out of Nazareth. And yet, here is Jesus. And he didn't just conquer a giant, he conquered death. He conquered death and rose again to give us all a hope. Throughout the Bible, we see countless examples of the kingdom of God being and using the smallest of things to do the greatest of things. And so in these parables, whenever we look at a mustard seed and whenever we look at yeast, we look at tiny, small things and God can do incredible things. I'm standing in this forest in, in these woods and this is an area where I would regularly run through and I just love just walking through and running through this area. But each one of these trees, although they're massive now, they all started as a seed. They all started in the smallest of ways. Now, a mustard plant doesn't grow as tall as these trees. It's the largest of the garden plants, it says, but it's not the largest of the trees. But yet it starts from such a small base and grows to being this size, to being three metres, up to three metres. And likewise with yeast. Yeast, you can hardly see yeast as you put it in the bread, but it can make such a big impact. God is saying the kingdom of God is like that. We're reading parables. Or it might be called proverbs. They are phrases that are being used to tell something of the kingdom of God. They don't fully explain it. They don't give sort of a very definitive or, or very precise language around it. But they are sayings in order for us to understand a little bit of the meaning. I've recently been reading a book by an author called Anthony Reddy. Anthony Reddy is, uh, is coming from a black theo theological background. As I've been reading it, he's been talking a little bit about how proverbs are used within African Caribbean traditions. And in doing so, he, he sort of says about how older generation women would use proverbs and they wouldn't tell all the meaning but they'd give you a flavour of something and he says this proverbs are concentrated applied wisdom for living the person who gives the saying does not usually explain what they have said rather the, sen the statement is simply made the importance of the learning for the hearer is to try to sort it out for themselves what the saying means and why it has been said with proverbs we need to read it and read it and think about it and think about all the different levels of meaning that there are. It's not normally plain to see. It's not often not obvious. And it's not obvious in this case either. We have a mustard seed. We have yeast. We have the tiniest of things. And yes, we could say, yes, great things come of them. But there is so much more to the meaning than that. Think of the yeast. The yeast is put into 30 kilograms of flour. 30 kilograms of flour. Think of how many bags of flour you need to do that and what that looks like and to have put yeast in it. It's a huge amount. It's a real weight 
upon the yeast whenever the yeast is in there. Likewise, a tiny mustard seed, if you plant it in the ground, think of the weight of all that soil that is on top. The things that press it down, the, 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 the things that are trying to keep it from swelling up, from growing. It's like that with the kingdom of God. Think of all the weight that is there, the culture that is around us, that constantly wants to stop the kingdom of God from growing, from developing. And yet, the kingdom of God does grow through it. It's countercultural. It's subversive. It's doing something against all the forces that are there that are trying to keep it back. That is a little bit more of the meaning behind the mustard seed and the, and the yeast. As we understand a little about, about what it means to be countercultural, I want you to watch this short clip. It's about Tierfan's theory of poverty and why, why poverty exists. But it explains a little bit about the culture that we've gone, got into. What are the forces that are trying to stop the kingdom of God? And what does it mean for us to try and build out of that? How does the kingdom of God grow in a subversive way, in a countercultural way, against the forces of the, of the worlds around about us, the culture around about us? Please watch carefully this clip. It's annoying how easily we break things. <laughs> what good is something that's broken? And what about the things we break that we can't throw away? The people we hurt? The situations we mess up? The unjust structures that we ignore? The ways we exert power over the poor. When it's played out on a global scale, it does more than just cause us pain as individuals. Communities, cities, nations suffer and struggle, compete and even fight. And this brokenness damages the planet itself. We are careless with this precious earth. We are greedy for all it gives. Natural resources are used up and fought over. The earth groans and suffers. This brokenness is where poverty comes from. Poverty isn't just a lack of money. It is a deep brokenness in the world that we experience in all kinds of ways. In hunger and insecurity, thirst and a lack of education, loneliness, sickness, violence and hopelessness. Our relationships with each other are damaged. Our relationship with the physical world is damaged. Even our relationship with ourselves, because we don't know who we are or where we belong. At the heart of all this brokenness is our broken relationship with God, who made everything in love and made it good. We have pulled away from Him and from His ways, and we are left diminished, unsure of who we are, or what we can do. All of us are affected, but some of us suffer more than others. What do we do with so much brokenness? Is that just the way it has to be? We believe that God has always been interested in mending things. And in Jesus, God came close and showed us how. Jesus doesn't just patch things up. The cross and the resurrection make possible a whole new creation. Not by throwing the old things away, but by redeeming and restoring them. And as we continue to be restored and healed, and our relationships are restored, God invites us to join His work. We get to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation and restoration. 
and it transforms all of those broken relationships with others, with the physical world, with ourselves, and with God. It's a ministry that is bigger than us. This is God's story and God's work. And one day, we believe it will reach its climax when Jesus returns and ushers in a life of wholeness for everyone once more. As I said, these are proverbs. It's hard to sometimes gra grasp a little bit of the meaning of what's there. However, whenever I look at the New Testament and I look at what the Kingdom of God is, it's nearly always spoken about in parables or proverbs. Apart from once, there's a particular line in the letter to the Romans. It's in Romans chapter 14, verse 17 which explains in a little bit more detail what the Kingdom of God is like. It says, the Kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. That's referring to following particular rituals. But it is of righteousness, of peace and of joy in the Holy Spirit. The Kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Let me unpack that a little bit further for you. We live in a world where righteousness, peace and joy can seem sometimes to be in short supply. Sometimes it's difficult to see quite how much there is in terms of righteousness, peace and joy around about us. Let me take one at a time and look through this. Let's think about peace to start with. As I said at the start, Tier Fund work in about 50 countries around the world. And in many of those countries, we're working in fragile states areas where there might be political turmoil or where there might be war or conflicts going on and we find that thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people end up as refugees or internally displaced as a result of conflict around the world. If you think of places like Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh where many Rohingya refugees came out of Myanmar and settled in that place those camps are massive, hundreds of thousands, and people are living shoulder to shoulder, literally just a sheet of tarpaulin separating houses. Tear Fund are working in areas like that in order to at least try and bring some sense of peace to those that are living there. We, not, we might not be able to solve the conflict, we not, might not be able to work towards that, but in living in those conditions, we can give individuals and families and communities a sense of peace that is there. Many of the people living there have been worried about the coronavirus pandemic, as we all have all around the world. But if you live in a situation where you're living so close to other people, you don't have good water supplies or good sanitation, you don't have proper toilets, you don't have soap, then actually your fears are going to maximise. So Tear Fund have been there trying to install water supplies in various forms, trying to provide soap to local people, giving them information and messaging and, and providing PPE equipment. And we can do that in other places around the world. There are many Venezuelan refugees who are living in Colombia and we've been doing the same there, as well as giving food parcels and other essential items to them. That's what it means in some ways to bring the Kingdom of God against the culture that is there. It's about bringing hope, bringing joy, a mustard seed of joy into that situation. Whenever I think of joy, I also think of a story of whenever I met a woman called Mariana in Rwanda. Mariana had actually been living there and she didn't have any money. She was as poor as you can get. She couldn't even afford the soap. And because she couldn't afford soap, her personal hygiene obviously went down and she felt embarrassed and ashamed. And so she just didn't leave her house. She became a hermit, not interacting with anybody in the community for anything. She felt hopeless and all those around about her thought that she had aged by 20 years. She was 61 and everybody thought she was in her 80s. 
the church reached out to her. This was through Tear Fund's work in church and community mobilisation where we work with local churches who in turn with local, work with their local communities in order to look and see what the needs are there and how they can address those needs and work with them. So the church reached out to Mariana. They saw that she was in need and they said, we would like to help. We would like you to come along and be part of some of the Bible studies that we're doing about how God can use the little things that we have. Come along, learn about it, and we hope to help you through it. She came along. And in fact, her small group that met together actually appointed her to be the leader of the group. She didn't know what to say. She was embarrassed. She was embarrassed enough being there, never mind being appointed as leader of the group. But what happened from there was that she was able to actually work alongside the group and they all pulled some of their resources together and provided a fund in which they could give out loans to members of the group. And in giving out loans, she was able to get a small loan to uh, plant some uh, sogum. And sogum's a plant in which you can make juice from. And she did that. She made some sogum juice and she was able to sell that to the local community and sell it at the market. And she was able to start bringing in income and she was able to buy soap. Whenever I met her, you should have seen her, the joy on her face. Here's a picture of her. And you can see that smile. In fact, we actually had one of the MSPs out with us, Jeremy Balfour, and she literally danced with him with joy at what God had done in her life through the local church. A mustard seed of joy in that situation was just remarkable. In a situation where things looked so bad for her, things looked hopeless for her. And yet the church was able to bring that joy. The third area is righteousness. What does it mean to bring a mustard seed of righteousness? Well, righteousness is actually a quite complicated term for us in English. But actually, if you take it back to its original translation, its original translation is justice. It's about bringing justice. The word dikaiosunu is the Greek word that is used there. And we know that we live in an unjust world. We see it all the time in various forms. But one area of injustice is through climate injustice. We find that actually the poorest around the world are the most affected by climate change. But the causes of climate change are directly related to those of us in the Western world who are constantly using energy, who are flying places, ordinarily if we're not in a pandemic, driving our cars, who are generating heat, who are using our mobile devices, who are using all sorts of things that take up energy and are actually putting carbon products into the air and causing the climate change. That has a huge effect on people around the world. We're just going to watch a short clip of somebody called Urbisa. And Urbisa lives in northeast, or, uh, northeastern Ethiopia, in the Afar region. And as we watch it, we'll be able to see a little bit about the effect that climate change has had on her and how we need to have some climate justice in the world. Please watch this. Your neighbour is thirsty. But there is a solution, and there is hope. For many people in the north of Ethiopia, the impact of climate change is devastating. They used to expect rain up to four months a year, but now it only falls in August. People don't have enough water to survive. It is an issue of life or death. And for families like Urbisa's, everyday life is a real struggle. My name is Obisa and I have nine children. Life is very challenging here. We have no food and are dependent on our livestock for our livelihood. Whenever there is no rainfall, our animals die as there is no grass or water. This affects our lives significantly. We will not get money or have milk to drink. We have no other option. When it rains, I only need to walk five minutes to collect water but these water sources are now dry. Every night, I walk for 10 hours to collect water from a lake. The walk is dangerous. I can face wild animals, such as hyenas and leopards. 
The water I collect is not sufficient. I am only able to collect less than half of what my family needs each day. We need most of it for drinking, but sometimes it is not enough and my family has to go to bed thirsty. I feel extremely sad whenever I cannot provide water for my children. It hasn't rained for six months and I don't know when it will rain next. It is God who knows when the rainfall will come. I worry about my children and my family. I worry about the small livestock which are remaining. I feel worried whenever I think about the future. If we could get water access in our village, this would change things for me. This is the first and most important thing that would give me hope. Orbisa's story is sadly all too common. Forced to find any kind of water, more people are getting sick and their livestock, their only source of income, are dying due to lack of water. Because of climate change, the area has become even more dry and arid, like a desert. People are suffering and many are giving up hope. But there is good news. Tear Fund is changing lives by working with local partners to set up solar powered wells that will provide clean water closer to communities. This will help to restore hope and give new life for all who live there. In the last 10 years, droughts are increasing from year to year. Availability of water is very, very difficult. Tear Fund has started now working with FSA, saving lives by creating access to portable water, drilling boreholes and developing water supply systems. The greatest joy and happiness we could see in communities is when they get water. Lives are being changed and they are seeing the love of Jesus. When we provide water for these communities, we are changing the lives of the coming generations too. The young people, the children, their lives will change definitely when we provide water for them. Please donate now. As you, as you can see, we are doing work within the Afar region to try and mitigate for some of those climate change effects. For somebody like Orbisa, where there is a river five minutes away from her, but climate change has caused it to, grow, to dry up most of the year round, that she needs to go and walk 10 hours just to get water. That is certainly an injustice. And we want to bring justice to situations like that. Part of it is by trying, us trying to address climate change. And next November, what's happening is that the UN leaders are coming to Glasgow, hopefully pandemic all depending, to talk about climate change and to talk about how we can slow down the acceleration of climate change and the increase in temperatures around the world. This week, we're actually experiencing Storm Epsilon it's called Storm Epsilon because we have ran out of letters in, the, in our normal alphabet, in our English uh, alphabet, for the names of the storms. So we've moved on to the Greek letters. We've only done that once before in 2005. Increased storms are happening here, but they're having a profound effect in other places around the world. And yet we can make a difference. We're working with our partners out there in Ethiopia to try and bring uh, water to them through using solar powered boreholes that dig down deep into the ground and bring the water up into big tanks that last for six months for that community. Every six months it's washed out and then it's refilled up again using the solar powered pumps. That can provide water to a whole community. And if you break down the cost, it costs us about £12 per month. Uh, so somebody giving £12 per month could actually support 12 households in providing that water. 12 pound a month, you know, that's a co cost of a coffee a week. It's not a lot of money. And yet it can make such a big difference to somebody like Orbisa. And that's just a flavour of some of the work that we do. We're trying to deal and mitigate with some of the issues of climate injustice all around the world in different forms. And so if you are willing to give and con contribute towards that and as we try to address some of these issues then please do 
You can do so by going to our website, go to www.tierfund.org forward slash give water. And you can hear more about our visa story, but also have an opportunity to either give on a, on a one-off basis or on a regular basis. But also I'd encourage you to pray. Pray about how Tear Fund, how our partners, but how we ourselves can be agents of righteousness or justice, joy and peace around the world. How we can bring those sprinklings of mustard seeds, those small things that we do in our day-to-day -day lives to try and make a kingdom impact. Let's take a moment to pray just now. Let's pray. Loving God, we do just thank you that you are a God who brings a different kingdom. Lord, we ask that you will help us to stand up for justice, joy and peace. May we be people who thirst for righteousness. And Lord, we pray for those all around the world who are suffering as a result of injustice or as a result of conflict or of just having their joy taken away by whatever means that may be. Lord, we do just ask that you will show us how to bring those small things, those small instances of, that are like mustard seed or yeast into those situations that it can transform everything because you can do so much with it. Lord, we ask for your help. Amen. Thank you very much.